determine biological sex, what we have to do is look at parts of the skeleton that are sexually dimorphic. So parts of the skeleton whose shape and form are determined by your genetic biological sex. And we do this by looking at a suite of traits on the pelvis and also on the skull. The pelvis is by far the most useful part of the skeleton for determining biological sex because it is, first of all, the most sexually dimorphic. It is the most different in males and females. And this is because the female pelvis in modern humans is adapted to suit childbirth. So you'll find overall the suite of traits that we see in females are conducive to successful childbirth, whereas the traits, traits that we see in males are not adapted in that way. Some argue that males are actually better adapted to bipedal walking because they haven't had to develop these adaptations. These are things relating to the breadth, the width, the height and the size of the pelvis overall. The skull is perhaps a slightly less reliable way of determining biological sex, and that's because it isn't adapted for childbirth. But the adaptations that we see on the skull are more to do with differences in robust robusticity between males and females. So you may be familiar with the fact that biological males generally have stronger, larger muscle bodies than females. This means they also have larger, stronger muscle attachments and larger joints as well. And this isn't about body size, it's not because men are taller. It's about the muscle strength and the muscle development. So on the skull, where there are a lot of muscle attachments that show this distinction, we can pick these out, we can score them on a range of gracile, which means slim and thin, through to robust, which is heavy and chunky, and determine females and males that way. These are the main morphological analyses, so analysis based just on looking at the human skeleton. But we can do other analyses based on measurements, metric analyses. You can do a metric analysis of the pelvis. You can measure a series of distances between various parts of the pelvis, use a discriminant function equation, and get a score for whether an individual is male or female. It's a very accurate method, but it relies on the pelvis being complete. So you can actually measure the different structures, and it also relies on very accurate measurements as well, which can sometimes be a bit challenging. Other metric methods rely on this difference in robusticity between males and females. So, for example, you can look at the overall size and shape of the joints and also the size and shape of the bones. So, for example, we could look at the circumference of the mid-shaft of the femur. So, essentially, we've taken a measurement all the way around the outside of the shaft of a femur. Broadly, there is a distinction between males and females. Females tend to have smaller mid-shaft circumferences than males, but there's also a huge overlap <coughs> in terms of these distances. So there's really a very, very few small women that we'd be able to identify, and a very, very few large males we'd be able to identify, but everybody else would just be sort of in this middle area where they may be female or male. It's not really a very good method for distinguishing males and females. We can also measure tooth dimensions. There has been sexual dimorphism found in the size and shape of the permanent teeth. Again, in this case, there is a large overlap area where teeth kind of correspond to the larger female and the smaller male areas. And this is one of the issues we find with metric methods, big overlap areas where people cannot be distinguished as male or female. So why are we interested in determining biological sex? Well, the sex structure of a population can indicate something about the composition of that population. Are we looking at a standard sex ratio, which would be around equal males and females, or there is some natural biological variability in that? Or are we looking at an unusual group of people? So an example would be a medieval monastic community, which could be universally male or universally female. We may be looking at a military population, which in many contexts tends to be a much more um, prevalent male population than a female population. So there's something that can be determined about the, the composition of that particular group. We also use sex as a way of exploring other aspects of osteological data. We can explore mortality by sex to look at differential mortality between males and females. One of the key issues there being the potential to pick out the fact that females may die younger because of dangers associated with childbirth. We can correlate sex with pathology to see whether a certain group of people have, say, a better or worse diet, whether certain diseases are preferentially affecting males or females, and so on. 
And we can also look, for example, at patterns of lifestyle in relation to sex. So are women more or less active than males? Are they doing the same sort of tasks every day or are they doing different tasks? Occasionally, we can also identify unusual sex-specific practices, for example, infanticide. One very interesting example comes from a Roman site known as the Ashkelon Sewer in Israel. Here, archaeologists found a large deposit of infant skeletons. Now, it's very challenging to determine biological sex in infant skeletons because the changes associated with puberty that make male structures more robust and allow the female pelvis to grow and develop to be suited for childbirth don't actually take place until you get to, to puberty. So DNA analysis was used to identify the biological sex of these infants. The vast majority were actually males. Now this really confused the archaeologists for a little while because they were assuming that in a, a case of sex-specific infanticide, it would be the girls who would be killed and the boys preferentially survive. And actually there is Roman documentary evidence to suggest that males were sometimes favoured within a family. However, in this case, this particular sewer and this particular site was associated with a brothel. And it's been argued that the male children were not going to be able to be kept because they weren't going to be able to work within the brothel. And the female children were kept because they could contribute to that society at the time. So it's not a very pleasant scenario, but it's one that we can understand in more detail by looking at sex-specific ratios. <laughs>